Welcome back to the Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan. You're listening to WMNF Tampa 88.5 FM. It's 1027 in the morning. In this segment, we're going, <clears throat> we're going to talk about the production of plastics and how that contributes to climate disruption. My guest is John Josevar, the Greenpeace Director of Oceans Campaign. He's a contributor to the new report called The Climate Emergency Unpacked, How Consumer Goods Companies Are Fueling Big Oil's Plastic Expansion. And uh, later in the show, we're going to open up the phone lines to talk about what you think about what you've heard so far in the show. The number is 813-239-9663. You can also email dj at wmnf.org or text 813-433-0885. But I want to welcome to WMNF, John Hosevar. And am I correct, correctly pronouncing your name? You've got it. Thank you. Uh, great. Thanks so much. So John is the Greenpeace Director of Oceans Campaign, contributed to a new report called The Climate Emergency Unpacked, How Consumer Goods Companies Are Fueling Big Oil's Plastic Expansion. So your report shows the business links of major global companies, maybe you can name some of them, to the fossil fuel industry, and that that means expanded plastic production. How does that all work? Yeah, I think, um, you know, most people realize that we have a plastic problem and that, you know, a lot of the single use plastic that we use ends up in the ocean and that's bad for turtles and whales and seabirds. Uh, but fewer people realize that it's also a significant climate issue. 99% of the plastic that we use is made from fossil fuels. And so, you know, our plastic bottles and plastic forks and all this stuff is often, often starts as a uh, natural gas, sometimes oil. And so um, we are seeing companies like Coca-Cola and Nestle and Procter and Gamble start to make, you know, slightly more ambitious uh, goals around climate change. But so far they're largely ignoring the fact that the vast majority of their packaging is really problematic. And you began to explain this, but maybe we could flesh this out because we have some time. So um, what is the life cycle of plastic? What's it like? How do you make plastic? And then what happens to it after, say, a single-use bottle um, goes into the recycling bin? Or, or what else could happen to it? Great question. So plastic really begins with, usually with natural gas. So sometimes fracking or other kinds of drilling. Uh, it gets refined and basically turned into the feedstock for plastic. Um, and then from there, you know, it's already an environmental justice issue because where plastic is refined tends to be in factories that are in the poorest parts of town, often in communities of color. Um, we see whole parts of the country set aside almost as sacrifice zones. There's an area in Louisiana and Texas known as Cancer Alley. Uh, because of the serious health impacts of, of oil and gas refinery, refineries, including for plastic. So then we have plastic, you know, we, we turn it into packaging often with food and drinks. So it's directly connecting to our food. Um, unfortunately, there are thousands of chemicals, at least 2000 chemicals that are commonly used in plastic packaging. And there's very little regulation of them. Uh, so we know that several of these can cause cancer, uh, whole classes of them have major reproductive health impacts. So especially when we heat plastic uh, in contact with our food and drinks, it can leach these chemicals into you know, what we bring into our bodies. Um, so it's still a problem. We haven't even turned it into waste yet. Um, one of the big issues with all this stuff is we use it for just a few seconds, sometimes a few minutes, and then we're done with it. Um, the myth is that we can recycle it, and so that's okay. But the vast majority of plastic, more than 90%, uh, we don't recycle, and it usually ends up in a landfill or an incinerator or directly into the environment. Um, so once we make it, there's no really great answer. Um, and that's part of our problem. Now we're trying to get rid of it. What happens then? Um, so if it's incinerated, that's releasing a lot of these toxic chemicals into the air, and then it rains down and gets into our soil and our water. If it goes into a landfill, I don't think anybody's idea of a great use of land is a landfill. So you know that's part of a problem, but also we have these toxic leaching into the soil and the water. 
Uh, and again, there's the environmental justice issue of, you know, it's not going to be in the nicest part of town usually. Uh, but if it ends up in the ocean, say, if it ends up in our waterways and, you know, gradually flows into the ocean, it doesn't just sit there as a bottle or a fork for, you know, forever. It breaks down into smaller and smaller pieces called microplastics. And in a lot of ways, that just makes it more dangerous. That's when, you know, just about anything can eat it and it enters food chains. Uh, so we see, you know, fish eating other fish that have eaten it on up. Uh, and then it's in our food. It's in the oysters that we eat. It's in the fish that we eat. And I want to remind people that we're speaking with John Hosevar. He's the Greenpeace director of the Oceans Campaign, contributor to a new report called The Climate Emergency Unpacked, How Consumer Goods Companies Are Fueling Big Oil's Plastic Expansion. You're listening to WMNF Tampa 88.5 FM. This is the Tuesday Cafe with Sean Canan. It's 1033 in the morning. And we're talking about plastics and uh, how, how plastics are, are part of the climate problem. So you were talking about when plastics break down and that they can be um, really broken down and, and the leach into our soil and leach into our water. You, that you would think that there would be some places in the planet where there's no plastic, but there have been some pretty amazing places where, where people have found either plastic or microplastics. What are some of those places? It's sad but true, actually. Uh, everywhere that we've looked, really, at this point, we find plastic. Uh, I've been on expeditions in the Antarctic uh, and the Arctic where we found microplastics in the water and in the snow. Um, there were plastics found in the bottom of the Mariana Trench, the deepest part of the world's oceans in the Pacific. Uh, we find plastic at the tops of the Rocky Mountains in the Pyrenees and in, in Europe. Um, we put so much plastic into our environment at this point that it's basically raining out of the sky. So it's in the food that we eat, the water that we drink, and the air that we breathe. What about alternative materials and recycling? Are, aren't those solutions to plastics or either, is either one of those a solution? And um, you know, how, how are they being implemented? I'd say the big solution for our plastic problem is to just stop making so much of it. Um, the good thing is that pretty much everyone, you know, whether it's, you know, your Aunt Sally or uh, our political leaders or corporate executives, everyone understands that we have a problem and then we need to do something about it. <laughs> Unfortunately, so far, most of the focus has been on what we call downstream approaches. You know, what can we do once we've already made the plastic? And really there aren't a lot of great answers at that point. The real solution is to stop making it in the first place, especially the single use plastic that we're only using for a few seconds. Um, the best answer, you know, the gold standard is not to just replace single use plastic with some other throwaway material, but to actually think about how we can shift to reuse, refill and package free approaches. There are a lot of people looking at you know, kind of alternative types of plastics. But um, for the most part, they, you know, they just add new and different problems. Um, it's possible someday that you know, we'll hit on the perfect answer there. But at the moment, we're not really seeing that as, as the way to go. Our guest is John Hosevar, Greenpeace Director of Oceans Campaign, contributor to a new report called The Climate Emergency Unpacked, How Consumer Goods Companies Are Fueling Big Oil's Plastic Expansion. You're listening to WMNF Tampa. This is the Tuesday Cafe with Sean Canan. And, um, you know, in your report, it talks about how public relations campaigns have taken the focus away from plastic pollution. Uh, you give the example of the Keep America Beautiful campaign. I think that was maybe the 70s or the 80s. Um, how, does, how do public relations campaigns take the focus away from the pollution of the plastic themselves? Plastic companies and, and companies like uh, Coke and Pepsi that you know sell us a lot of things packaged in plastic have worked really hard to deflect the responsibility uh, from themselves onto us, onto individual consumers or customers. Um, and, you know, I could see why they would want to do that, right? I mean, they, they, wanna, they want us to believe that everything's okay and that as long as, you know, we're not litter bugs and who wants to be a litter bug, then everything's going to be all right. Um, but again, the fact is that, you know, almost none of this plastic gets recycled. Very, very 
small portions. Um, only plastic bottles and jugs. The if you look in the recycling symbol on the, you know, on whatever piece of plastic that you're about to either throw away or put in your recycling bin, it's got a number that goes from one to seven. But anything that's a three, a four, a five, a six, or a seven is not going to be recyclable in most of the country. Um, and of the ones and twos, it's really only bottles and jugs. So everything else is going to end up in a landfill, an incinerator, or straight into the environment. This is John Hosevar, the Greenpeace Director of Oceans Campaign. He's a contributor to the new report called The Climate Emergency Unpacked, How Consumer Goods Companies Are Fueling Big Oil's Plastic Expansion. Mm -hmm. And we do have a couple of people on the telephone line, if you don't mind taking some questions. Uh, this first question, it sounds like it's uh, going to be about microfibers. So John Impometto, what's your question? Uh, I got on there when you just first started. It started about the microfiber. Uh, and it's very different. I didn't think it was going to be brought to the conversation. As far as composting, people need to realize that it, it takes almost a gallon or more of water to make a gallon of that comes in it, you know? So we really, really, really need to find alternatives. The biggest contribution to the thinking that's coming through is with microfiber, which is all the fatty extras, and it's coming through the waste plus the treatment plant. Because when you do your laundry, you reach about three percent microfiber footprint when you dry it. So there's so many ways where they really do need to find, as the young Tom said, uh, alternative methods. John, thank you for the call. You are, were a little bit difficult to understand, but I was wondering if our guest, John Hosevar from Greenpeace, did hear the question and, and uh, can respond, or do you want me to uh, try to paraphrase? But I, I mostly picked up on uh, that he was, he was bringing up microfibers, and that's an a area of huge concern. These are tiny, tiny bits of plastic that are um basically spinning off of synthetic clothing so you know almost any of the clothing that we have that is a little bit of stretch in it when you put that in a washing machine it's going to spin off an enormous a truly shocking number of these plastic microfibers and they're not filtered out so they go straight out into and, you know through the drain and into uh, waste management and out into our waterways so um that's that's a huge concern. And the other big source of plastic microfibers is from tires. You know, people think of tires as rubber, but a lot of tires these days are actually made from plastic. Uh, so as your, you know, your car is spinning down the road, it's also spinning off, you know, gazillions of these tiny little bits of, of plastic. And so these things are so small they're you know they're smaller than most of the microplastics that we you know what that we get when our bottles and uh you know lighters and everything else break down and they can be so small that they when they're in our bodies they can pass through cell walls we worked with a scientist from scripps oceanographic institute out on the west coast and he estimates that the average person has between three and five million plastic microfibers in their body right now. The projections are that this is going to possibly double in the next, say, 20 years or so. And, you know, obviously that's that's not the future that any of us want for ourselves. So this is the moment where we realize, okay, well, what we've been doing is causing some pretty serious problems um, for climate, for health, for environmental justice, uh, and also for our oceans. So this is the moment where we decide, are we going to just allow this problem to continue to grow or are we going to deal with it? Our guest is John Hosevar, the Greenpeace Director of Oceans Campaign, a contributor to a new report called The Climate Emergency Unpacked, How Consumer Goods Companies Are Fueling Big Oil's Plastic Expansion. You're listening to WMNF Tampa. This is the Tuesday Cafe with Sean Canan. You can join this conversation by calling 813-239-9663. You could also email dj at wmnf.org 
or you could text 813-433-0885. We have an email question here from Bubba or text that is, and he writes, what happens when you burn plastic? Can it be used for energy? So um, I guess two, two questions in one, can you create energy by burning plastic, but then what happens to the, the residuals after they're burnt? Yeah, that's a good question. That in fact is part of what industry is pushing for at this point. They're, they're saying, look, it's okay that we've been producing all this plastic waste. Uh, we can turn it into fuel and it'll be cost effective and uh, it's okay. Um, the fact is, you know, we, we talked about this a little in the beginning, since plastic is made from fossil fuels, we're really still just burning fossil fuels uh, if we're burning plastic. And that is something that, you know, we obviously, we need to be moving away from as quickly as possible. Um, the other piece, and you, you raise this in your question, is when we're burning plastic, there's a lot of toxic chemicals that uh, we're basically releasing into the atmosphere. And burning plastic incineration uh, can cause um, release of dioxin, some of the most toxic chemicals that uh, we know of, into our air and then into our water and our soil. And, um, Going back to you know the ways that plastic impacts our health and and gets into our bodies, there's so much microplastic at this point, so many microfibers in our soil that uh, plants are taking plastic up through their root systems. So at this point, it'd be difficult to eat even something you know as quintessentially healthy as an apple without eating plastic in every bite. Let's take a call now from DeAndre in Sun City. Hi, DeAndre, you're on the air. What would you like to ask about plastics? I'm curious about the chemicals that are now able to be drawn from used plastics, such as plastic bags. And also, I'm curious to know about uh, uh, well, how the campaign was going with, for a while with some folks, like on YouTube, upcycling. Thanks, DeAndre. How would you respond, John? Uh, Sean, do you mind paraphrasing? I missed some of that. Yeah, so um, plastic bags are not very easily recyclable, as we know. Um, and DeAndre was saying they're, they're, they have thought that there might be some way to, um, to recycle some parts of, of those. Is there, is there a new trick of how to convert the plastics from plastic bags into usable products? That's one of the, his questions. So almost anything is technically recyclable if you throw enough energy and money and time at it. But it doesn't always mean that it makes sense from an economic standpoint or from an environmental standpoint. And plastic bags are unfortunately a good example of something that, you know, it's it just doesn't really make sense. Uh, there aren't any great ways to turn plastic bags, say, into more plastic bags. Um, occasionally there are types of plastic where you can downcycle. Um, you can turn them maybe from a bottle into, um, you know, a park bench, uh, or carpet actually is one of the most common things that happens after plastic is recycled. But once you're done with that carpet, it's almost definitely going to a landfill or an incinerator. So even for the few types of plastic that do get recycled, Recycling is really just a brief pause in between fracking or drilling on one side uh, and an incinerator or landfill at the end of its life. Our guest is John Hosevar, the Greenpeace Director of Oceans Campaign. He's a contributor to a new report called The Climate Emergency Unpacked, How Consumer Goods Companies Are Fueling Big Oil's Plastic Expansion. 
You're listening to the Tuesday Cafe with Sean Canan on WMNF Tampa 88.5 FM. It's 1047 in the morning, and we have been taking your calls as well. If you'd like to call in at 813-239-9663, you can email dj at wmnf.org. You can text 813-433-0885. And this next question that we had emailed in, I'm going to play a little uh, soundbite um, along with the, with the question. So this is from David. He says, it's weird to think about how plastics were seen as a futuristic invention in a futuristic innovation back in the 1960s. And he reminds us about the graduate film and Dustin Hoffman's character. The appearance of plastics found everywhere in the world reminds me of the menace of PFOAs and how those insidious chemicals are in everyone's blood. So that's the comment from David. Let's hear a little bit about what he's talking about from the graduate. We won't play too long of this, but you'll get the idea. I just want to say one word to you. Just one word. This is just some plastics. All right, well, that's just a tiny segment of the, uh, the, the graduate film back in the 1960s. So uh, John, to, to the point of David, or the person who emailed, you know, this was in their um, maybe parroting it a little bit in the film, but plastics were the future, and now uh, we're, we're having to deal with the actual reality of that future. Any thoughts? That's absolutely right. Uh, you know, it goes back to the 50s. That was where we really began our, our plastic addiction, and there's a, a famous piece in Life magazine where it had a woman just basically throwing up, um, you know, all these plastic plates and forks in the air. And the, the idea was that everything was going to be so much easier, so much more co convenient for us. We wouldn't have to wash dishes or anything anymore. We could just use these plastic ones once and throw them away. And uh, how, how great is this going to be, this future that we're creating for ourselves where we don't have to spend all this time washing things anymore? Um, it's fascinating seeing how some of the things that seem like such good ideas at the time really have come back to haunt us a little bit. And there are a few examples of that. I mean, you know, obviously the, our reliance on, uh, on fossil fuels is, is, a, a, is probably the biggest one. Uh, plastic is another. When people invented uh, DDT, it earned them the Nobel Prize. Um, you know, this was seen as a really powerful tool to deal with um, insect-borne disease. And it's true, it does that, uh, but also it, it kills everything else too. And, um, you know, eventually we realized how serious of a problem that was, and DDT is, is largely banned. Another example is, um, the, uh, oh no, I can't think of the word, the insulation, the, you know, the really toxic insulation, of asbestos. Um, so that, that was another one. It was cost effective. It was, it worked really well. And then we realized, oh, it's, you know, it's giving us cancer. Um, we probably should stop using it everywhere. Um, and the last example, and probably the most relevant here is uh, the chemicals that we use that we realized we're creating a giant hole in the ozone layer. And that this was so serious that it, you know, it was creating an existential threat for, for humanity and, and for life on earth to some extent. And so very quickly, the earth, the, the um, international community came together and banned these chemicals. And that hole in the ozone layer first stopped growing and is starting to actually heal itself. And this is, I think, uh, the example, the vision for us now with plastic, we've realized that we've made a mistake, you know, that our, our reliance on single-use plastic, that we're creating trillions, literally trillions of throwaway items a year out of material that lasts for hundreds of years uh, is not a, great, not a great idea. So this is our moment. There will be a, a meeting in February where the United Nations comes together 
and agrees almost definitely uh, agrees to begin negotiating a new global plastic treaty, our first global plastic treaty ever. Um, and this is a, it's a hopeful moment. Um, of course, there will be countries that are lobbying to, you know, carry on as we have been, um, but far more fortunately realize that we need to do something pretty different. Our guest is John Hosevar, the Greenpeace Director of the Oceans Campaign. He's a contributor to a new report called The Climate Emergency Unpacked, How Consumer Goods Companies Are Fueling Big Oil's Plastic Expansion. And that's interesting that you mentioned that February meeting where, where the UN might make a treaty on plastics because that takes me to a UN meeting or a, a national, international meeting that's going on right now, the COP26. And I'm not sure if you're um, prepared to talk much about it, but what can you tell of our listeners about the draft text that was released in the last day or so of that COP26 document and how our, whether the nations of the world are responding um, adequately enough to deal with climate change? Is that something that you're prepared to talk about? I could say a little, and uh, you know, the short version is that unfortunately we're not seeing the level of ambition or urgency from uh, the vast majority of the world's governments that we need right now. Certainly not from the U.S., uh, but the U.S. isn't alone. And we're really, it's a lot of people went into this meeting with uh, some real hope that this would be our chance to you know, finally take this issue seriously enough. Um, but so far, it's just not happening. Uh, we're, you know, we're seeing, for the most part, weak commitments that are not going to um, protect us from runaway climate change. And for, you know, for, for your listeners in Florida, uh, this is a, a very serious issue. So much of Florida is very low lying. Um, and sea level rise is one of the, you know, most undeniable aspects of climate change. Uh, and we'll see large portions of the state underwater, you know, in, in uh, our children's lifetimes. Our guest is John Hosevar from Greenpeace, the director of the Oceans Campaign. We're talking about their new report, The Climate Emergency Unpacked, How Consumer Goods Companies Are Fueling Big Oil's Plastic Expansion. It's 10.54 in the morning, and you're listening to WMNF Tampa. This is the Tuesday Cafe with Sean Canan. I uh, have a couple of people on the line, so I'm going to go back to the phones. I also should say that I think it was Sherry was on the line and then dropped off. So if you'd like to call back Sherry, I'll, I'll put you back uh, in the queue. Warren in Zephyr Hills, what would you like to ask? So, John, uh, in one of the previous callers, asked about uh, burning plastics, and um, I'd like to frame that in uh, in residential um, component where uh, you say you have a you know rural uh, population that you know burns their garbage. Now, uh, I think you referred to dioxin as the uh, predominant runoff or contaminant um, from that. And I'm curious about that leaching. So if you have a, a rural uh, homestead where this plastic being burnt, is that leaching into people's, uh, you know, well, you know, a property that has well water and uh, the water table. And if that is uh, considered like through the EPA or local jurisdictions, as like illegal dumping or uh, hazardous waste dumping? Thanks for the question, Warren. Were you able to hear that question, John? Yes, thank you, Sean. Uh, you know, I'm not, I, I'm not sure that, I, I'm guessing that the legality of that varies from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, but from strictly a, a health standpoint, I wouldn't want to do that uh, where I lived. Um, I do think that, you know, it's, it has some, in the very immediate environment, it has some impact on uh, air quality for sure. I mean, you don't wanna be breathing that stuff in, but, but for your question, I think you're right to be worried about it contaminating water supplies. Um, so, you know, kind of regardless of, of what the law is where you live, uh, I wouldn't recommend it. 
Jeff writes in, is biodegradable plastic a real solution? Thanks for that question. Um, you know, maybe someday it could be, um, but for the most part, what we're seeing with plastic labeled as biodegradability or biodegradable is, is what I would call greenwashing. Um, we've had people, you know, just as an experiment, take, a, take something that was supposedly biodegradable or, or compostable similarly uh, and put it in their garden and then dig it up five years later and it looked the same. And one of the reasons is that you see um, the, re the actual requirements of, of these things uh, to, be, to biodegrade. It, it doesn't happen at the temperatures that we typically find in the ocean, for example. It needs to be warmer than what we would, what we would see. Um, similarly, compostable can, you know, when, when you find compostable plastic, it can do more harm than good. Um, most of the material recovery facilities, you know, where your curbside recycling goes, um, don't really have the, the means to sort out this compostable plastic. It looks like the normal, normal plastic, but it doesn't recycle in the same way. So um, it ends up contaminating recycling streams without really being uh, compostable or recyclable. So uh, maybe someday, but for the most part, not, not yet the answer. Now the report you're involved in is the climate emergency unpacked how consumer goods companies are fueling big oils plastic expansion. So in the 30 seconds or so we have left, how could these major consumer goods companies change their ways in order to help reduce the expansion of plastics? I think really quickly we can see companies move away from most types of throwaway plastic. Uh, a little bit more difficult, but really where they need to be heading is moving from single-use plastic to reuse, refill, and package-free approaches. And in some cases, that's going to involve us working together. That's going to involve some policy change to help on the design end and the infrastructure side of things. But that's where we need to go. Well, thanks so much for coming on WMNF today, John. My pleasure. It's great to talk to you. John Hosevar is the Greenpeace Director of the Oceans Campaign. He's a contributor to a new report called The Climate Emergency Unpacked, How Consumer Goods Companies Are Fueling Big Oil's Plastic Expansion. And I want to thank Barbara Fling for answering our phones today. You have been listening to The Tuesday Cafe with Sean Canan. Coming up next is Janelle Irwin in her new time, 11 o'clock on Tuesday mornings with The Scoop. That's coming up after NPR headlines. And in this time slot tomorrow, Shelly will host Midpoint. She's going to interview experts about local redistricting of political districts. At, and that's at 10 o'clock on Wednesday morning. You're listening to WMNF Tampa, St. Petersburg, Sarasota, and Lakeland. Thanks so much for listening to the Tuesday Cafe with Sean Canan.